We all wish Michael and his colleagues the very best at the beginning of a new chapter in the history of Rangers Football Club. The format for today's meeting is as follows. We will shortly begin with the formal business of our AGM. We will then have a couple of presentations. A presentation on our strategy to adapt IBROX for fans who require accessible seating, followed by a brief financial presentation. We will then have a question and answer session with Michael. Our company secretary, James Blair, is unable to join us today, but I am pleased that the solicitor of Ruth Farker of Anderson's Return will now oversee the proceedings as we undertake the formal business of the AGM. Welcome, Bruce. Thank you, Douglas. Um, good morning, everyone. I would like to reiterate to you, our chairman, Douglas Parks, welcome to the meeting. And to introduce myself, I'm Bruce Farker, Chairman and Partner of Anderson Sothern. I've been appointed by the Board to attend today as cover for your company secretary, James Blair. Uh, unfortunately, James has slipped a disc in his back, and James has asked me to pass on his apologies for being unable to attend today's meeting. He's hoping to be back on his feet soon. So I will introduce you to today's attendees, running from my immediate right, we have from the Rangers Football Club Limited, Kenny Barclay, the Finance Director. <laughs> then from your company's board, we have Graham Park <laughs> and Alistair Johnston. <laughs> then again, from your football club, we have our Sporting Director, Ross Wilson. And joining us, the new manager of Rangers Football Club, Mr. Michael Beale. And I'm pleased to say that we'll be hearing from Michael later. Next to Michael, we have your chairman, Douglas Park. And vice chairman, John Bennett. And from your operating company, Managing Director Stuart Robertson. <laughs> company Marketing Director James Bisgrove. <laughs> and Director of Football Administration Andrew Dixon. <laughs> Finally, we're pleased to welcome Greg McKnight from your auditor's assets. <laughs> With the consent of the Chair, I'll move to the formal proceedings of this annual general meeting. The notice of the meeting with explanatory notes was posted to shareholders on 8th November 2022. I shall take the notice as read. Today's voting will be conducted on a poll on each of the resolutions put to the meeting. And I shall now run through each of the resolutions. As I do so, your screen will show the terms of that resolution. There are three options for voting, to vote for, against, or to abstain. And a vote withheld is not a vote in law and will not be counted in the calculation of the proportion of votes for or against a resolution. Voting cards have been provided, and these will need to be completed by you, signed, and deposited in the ballot box as you leave the meeting. The results of the voting, including the proxy votes already received, will be announced and posted on the company's website after today's meeting. We'll now proceed to vote on the resolutions one to eight, which I will formally propose to the meeting. The full text of each of the resolutions is set out in the notice of the meeting and shown on the screen as I speak. Resolutions one to seven are proposed as ordinary resolutions and require a simple majority to be passed. Resolution eight is proposed as a special resolution which requires 75% of those voting to vote for in order for it to be approved. The first resolution is to receive and adopt the financial statements, the director's reports and the strategic report for the year ended 30th June 2022, together with the auditor's report. 
Resolutions two to four are to re-elect re directors of your company. Each of Douglas Park, Julian Walhard, and George Taylor retire in accordance with the Articles of Association and being eligible, each is offering himself up for re-election at this AGM. And the board is recommending that each be re-elected as a director. Resolution 5 deals with the reappointment of assets audit services as auditors. And Resolution 6 deals with their remuneration. Resolution 7 is to authorise the allotment of shares. The proposal is that the directors be authorised to allot shares in accordance with the terms set out in the resolution you'll be seeing on the screen. And the board is aware that there has been some concern among shareholders about Part B of Resolution 7. And the board would like to reassure members that after this year, it is their intention that the members will be asked to affirm their continued approval to the subsequent allotments at each year's AGM. <clears throat> Resolution 8 will give the directors authority to allot shares for cash without first offering them to existing shareholders in proportion to their existing holding of shares. The circumstances of such an allotment are recounted in the resolution and in the explanatory notes set out alongside the notice. That authority will expire on 5th December 2027 and as this is a special resolution, a 75% majority will be required. Now, that concludes the voting business of the meeting and I shall now invite Andrew Dixon to present on the club's plans for disabled facilities. Good morning, everyone. At last, at last year's AGM, the board committed to improving the, the accessibility of Ibrox Stadium for all disabled people. Following the AGM, an action plan was developed with a clear set of objectives designed to achieve this. This ambitious plan was, is not only based on the standards set out in the UEFA Access for All and Green Guide recommendations, but aims to place Ibrox Stadium as an exemplar of best practice in Scotland for the inclusion of all disabled people within the stadium. In developing this project, we explored good practice examples of stadiums in the UK and across Europe from which we could learn. We commissioned the Glasgow Access Panel to carry out an access audit of the stadium. They produced a comprehensive report which set a detailed set of recommendations for the improvement of the accessibility across all areas of the stadium. This project focuses on one major area highlighted in the access audit, which is the development of wheelchair accessible seating and amenity seating for other disabled people across the stadium. Over the past six months, we have engaged and consulted with a wide range of stakeholders, including architects, civil engineers, building contractors, and accessibility experts with many years experience of collaborating with the club. This group was tasked to explore a wide range of alternatives within the stadium and to identify the most viable option for the club. We also consulted with the Disability Matters Group, the Rangers Forum of Disabled People throughout whose input and feedback has been invaluable. Following this process, a project team gathered from the expertise detailed already was assembled to conduct a detailed feasibility study to take the plan forward. Whilst the board are fully committed to the first part of the video, we will share with you now, which addresses the accessible seating issue. The second element of the video is a more significant investment and is contingent upon the ongoing ability 
of your board to raise equity funding. However, we believe it was still appropriate to share the video with you in full. One of the most significant changes the club has faced, sorry, challenges the club has faced, which we'll, you will see in the video, is the impact on existing seating and season ticket holders who will lose their seats. Without replacing those seats and rehousing the affected supporters, there will be a recurring loss of revenue. Throughout the work and time invested in the research and development of the plan, we will share with you today there was a collective desire from the board to impact the limit on existing season ticket holders and mitigate any revenue loss. Therefore, the preference of all within the club would be to go, to go further than the redevelopment and add additional seating as part of the project. We will now play the video. As you can see, this is an ambitious plan that will see the provisional wheelchair accessible seating increase from 114 to 272, whilst also incorporating amenity seating provision for other disabled people with a range of impairments. This will provide our disabled supporters with access to all areas and the ability to view matches from a range of vantage points around the stadium. The work will also see the development of accessible facilities around the stadium, including level access to all areas of the stadium, additional accessible toilet facilities 
including a changing places toilet, additional accessible kiosks with lower, lower level counters to accommodate wheelchair using supporters, lifts specifically designed to take supporters directly to the accessible platform, an increase in trained access stewards to provide support across the stadium. The, impl the, implement the implementation of the accessible seating and isolation will incur a significant seat loss of seating, as you have just seen. This would impact on 1,073 season tag holders and cause an annual recurring revenue drop of in excess of £500,000. We also believe that the best mitigation of the loss of this revenue is to progress with the cantilever option that we have just shared with you, which will provide a further 1,800 seats. There is a significant capital investment required to do so, but one where we believe the payback to be reasonable and justifiable in this context. It is yet another project that the Board believes justify, justifies our ongoing strategy of seeking strategic equity funding to invest in long-term revenue-generating gener initiatives. If there are any questions on this, we will answer that at the end. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's fantastic to see so many of you here today for the AGM. And what a daunting challenge to follow such an impressive presentation of the plans that we have for Ibrox. I'm also very uh, aware of the fact that a large proportion of you will be waiting in anticipation of the Q&A with Michael. So I will hold you for as, as short a period as, as possible. But your board and I were, were very keen and thought it important to give a short presentation on what we see and took as the key highlights of our financial results for the year to the 30th of June 2022. We as a board saw these as, as very positive results, um, both, both in isolation but also to, to show and substantiate the trend and the progress that we've been making over the years. There has been a lot of coverage of the results across various channels um, since we released, most of it very positive and very insightful. So the aim of this presentation is to try and provide some context and possibly some clarification around the most material areas of the results. This slide is trying to condense what is a 60-page annual report and documents into, into one slide of, of highlights. And as I was pulling it together, I did think compared to some years in the past where it would have been a real search to find a page full of highlights. There's actually been so many this year, the challenge was actually to condense them down and, and pull out the most appropriate ones. Um, and given the, the focus of this presentation, I make no excuse for the fact that it is, it is highlighted and, and focused around the financial rather than football side. But as you'll see as we go through the presentation, there is an intrinsic link between a lot of it. The, the first area that I wanted to highlight was our, our revenue performance. Um, we saw this year growth across all the key pillars of our, of our revenue. So our ticketing, our European performance, our commercial revenues, and other areas. Um, although there was growth across all, I thought it was very important to, to highlight the record performance of the, the commercial department through our hospitality, through our commercial partnerships, and through our merchandising revenue. We have delivered a record revenue for the year, which has been hugely beneficial to the club. As well as our day-to-day -day revenue, this year marked huge progress in our player trading and the profit that we've been able to generate from that. This is the first year in 10 where we've been able to deliver a material impact to our total income from our player trading revenue. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the slides to come. But our total revenue of 87 million was 82% 
increase on prior year and quite interestingly three times the level of revenue that we generated in our first year back in the Premier League in 2017. So that does demonstrate the progress that we are making across all areas of our club. And that helped us deliver for the first time in five years a positive operating profit. So we had a, the contribution from our, our day to day activities actually helped and contributed towards the funding and cash requirement of the club. And that profit at operating level of 5.8 million was an improvement of almost 28 million from the previous year, albeit COVID impacted. Also thought it might be quite interesting for you to know that that bottom line profit or loss of 0.9 million pounds of a loss, actually in comparison against top level European clubs and Champions League clubs is one of the best performances financially of those clubs that have reported their results. So it does show the progress that we are making as a club. And that contributed to our positive operating cash flow. So we brought in cash from our operating activities, as I say, which contributed towards the overall cash requirement of the club, which we utilised across a number of projects, capital in nature, both on field in terms of our playing squad and off the field in terms of the, the fabric of our stadium, the facilities at our training ground and all over the club to bring up the standard of our facilities. As well as those, what you would call day-to-day -day operations, we also over the, over the course of the year made progress in normalising our funding structure. Now, what I mean by that is like any business, you have three levels of, of funding or capital in your business. You have your equity, your shareholders, you have long-term debt, which funds the, the longer term capital project, like the one you just saw. And then we have day-to-day -day working capital requirements, which takes account of the periods of the year or the periods of the month, where due to the timing of the cash flows that come in, we have a requirement to access some debt. Over the course of this year, we have managed to look at that structure across all three levels and put in place a structure that gives us as a board and us as a company the flexibility and availability of capital to meet the needs of our day-to-day -day running of the company. Which has helped us to make quite a, what I would class as a massive step forward in terms of our financial performance. And that is the removal of the material uncertainty qualification to our audit report of our financial statements. And what that means is that the auditors, for the first time in over five years, and actually if you look back for over 10 years, to get comfortable about the ongoing ability of the company and the club to access the finance it requires, to meet its day-to-day -day requirements, and to continue forward as a going concern. That progress is massive for the club. And I think it's, it's verification of a number of things. The delivery of the performance that we've had over the years, the supportable and deliverable assumptions that we're making, and the strategy that we have going forward. And most importantly, a stable structure in place to take the club forward on a strong foundation. So as I say in the slide, these are all significant progress towards financial sustainability that we talk about. But as you'll see over the, the following slides, without undue sacrifice in the investment that we need to make as a club to progress forward. I've provided a couple of slides just to give some more context and some more detail around some of those highlights I've talked about in the first slide. This graph here shows the three different elements from the set of account that contribute to our total income. So it consolidates our revenue line, our other operating income, and the profit from our player trading activity. What that graph shows, as I talked about, growth year on year in all aspects. Our core revenues that we generate as a business 
are restricted in some ways because of the, the, um, the league that we participate in. And like any club that particip participates in a league outside the, the big five, the chance for us to access the, the scale, size and scale of broadcast revenues that some other clubs and countries can access limit how much we can do in terms of our, our revenue. To give some context on that, in the year to June 2022, we generated revenue of £86.8 .8 million. That included progress to a European final. Norwich City, who finished last in the English Premier League in the same year, generated revenues of £134 million, almost double what Rangers were able to generate. So because of that challenge, we have to maximise all the possible channels of revenue that we can to continue to grow as a club. In the last two years, we have, we have benefited from a combination of insurance claims around the impact of COVID, but also in the, in the most recent year from the, the compensation that we received for our management team moving on to, to Aston Villa which gave a positive contribution to our revenue. But as you'll see there, for the first time in the last five in, in the year 21-22, we actually had a material and sizable block of revenue in the form of £11.2 million that came as a player trading gain from the activity that we had in the, in the transfer market. To give some context on that, that is slightly over 10% of our total, our total revenue. That is still small in comparison to, to clubs our size and clubs our nature. So we recognise that we are still taking the first steps towards really making our player trading activity being a material part of our revenue going forward. But it does show the progress that we are making. And in next year, given the transfer activity that we had in the, in the summer, we will see yet further progress on that. But I did highlight there that the player trading profit that we earned last year was more than we had generated in the nine years previous. So we've st we're starting from a, a, a low point, but we are moving forward and we saw the tangible benefit of that in this year. But player trading isn't a one-way street. We, we recognise that there is a requirement to invest in the squad. And I thought it was helpful just to show what that's looked like for the last five years. Where we have invested in the squad, both in terms of transfers, but also in terms of the increasing cost of the squad that we have. And that is set against a background of being loss-making for the last five years. To give some context to those, those numbers, in terms of player trading transfer activity, that block is showing the net cash spend. So it's showing what physical cash we actually paid out. As you probably know, transfer agreements tend to be spread over a period of time. So the headline transfer fee will be paid over a period. That goes for purchases and for sales. So what this is actually showing is what do we have to physically put out in terms of cash for those transfers. Those transfer fees include whatever we agree is a transfer, what we have to pay to agents as part of arranging that deal. It also includes what we class as contingent transfers, so elements of transfer fee that become payable upon certain things happening, whether that be number of appearances or qualification for certain competition, which isn't always highlighted at the time of that kind of trumpeting of the, the amount that's being paid on a transfer. So you can see that for five years, we have consistently grown what we have spent in terms of, of um, net player spend. We have consistently grown the cost of our, our first team squad in terms, of, in terms of wages, which for many people is the most accurate level of assessing the value of a squad, the amount, you're, the amount you're paying them, all set against a backdrop of the club making operating losses. So there has been significant investment in the playing squad. 
that might surprise some people and brings us on to what I see as a very important slide to give an understanding of the underlying flow of cash within the business and how over the last five years we have met the requirements of the, the cash requirement of the business and how we spent our money. So actually as a, as a headline for this slide, it could have been where has the money been spent. It's worth noting when you're looking at this slide that it doesn't include the impact of Champions League qualification this year. It is only to the 30th of June 2022, so it also doesn't include the transfer fees related to the sale of Joe Aribo and Calvin Bassey. But if I take you from the, the left-hand side of the, the chart to the right-hand side, on the 1st of July 2018, the club had £2.9 million of cash available. In the five years since, the operating cash flow, so the operating cash need of the business, excluding European prize money, was just short of £39 million. Through the progress and, and um, success that we've had in Europe, we've managed to earn £43.6 million of European prize money. And it's worth noting that's actually from four years rather than five years, because in that first year, when we were back in Europe, the level of prize money we achieved was actually very low. So that European performance had very much underpinned the day-to-day -day operation of the club. In the five years since July 2018, we have spent £60.2 million on player transfers. And over the same period, we've brought in £13.5 million of revenue from player sales. We spent just under £16 million on capital expenditure projects. That goes all across the stadium, all across the training ground. New projects like New Emerson House, where we have invested for future revenues. We then have a, a small bracket of, of what we've paid out on long-term leases, on interest, on, on finance that we have, bringing us to an overall funding requirement or net requirement over those five years of £58 million which has been filled by investor funding from predominantly from our investor shareholder group to then bring us to the point that at the end of the year we had 13.1 million pounds in the bank. It's worth noting that that 13.1 million then has to keep us going through the, the full year that we're in at the moment. That includes season ticket money that has been paid up front. Um, and in terms of some of the progress we made around financing and capital structure that I talked about, we were able to receive improved terms in terms of how quickly we're able to access that, that cash. So we have £13.1 million in the bank that will then support us through, the, through this year. So hopefully that provides a little bit of context to just what happens to the cash within our business and how important the financial results of this year have been to that financial sustainability we talk about. Those slides have all been, if you like, backwards looking. I did think it would be helpful, um, given the amount of coverage that there was around the, the financial impact of qualification for the, the Champions League. And most importantly, to give some, some context to actually what it means for us as a club. That graph shows the guaranteed prize money received by the clubs in our Champions League group before a ball was kicked. So that shows that the teams that we were competing against in the group earned between 1.8 and 2.8 times the amount of prize money that we got. That was influenced predominantly by our ranking in the 10-year European coefficient, where we are still hindered by 
five years of not having competed in Europe. But as each year goes away, that, that drops off and we are seeing progress up that, that table. But also it shows the impact of the comparatively low level attached to the media rights of the Scottish market. So we are fighting against a, 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 a strong headwind when it comes to that financial um, prize money that we can earn. And just to give a little bit more context around the overall impact of, of Champions League performance, once all match day revenues and associated costs of participating in the, in the Champions League is compared to what we budget or forecast at the beginning of the year from our expected progress in the Europa League, it amounts to less than £3 million incremental revenue. So it's positive, it's an upside, and as I highlight there, the certainty of that revenue, it doesn't depend upon subsequent performance in the group, is very positive. But it's probably less than a lot of you out there would have thought. That will obviously then flow into this year's results, which combined with those transfer activities that we talked about, we expect to be even more positive than, than what we've delivered this year. And we look forward to talking about them in a year's time. So hopefully that presentation has been, been helpful and, and informative. As I said, we believe as a board that the financial performance of 2022 has been hugely positive and provided further evidence of the progress that we're making as a, as a club. But we recognise that we cannot rest in our laurels on that. There are continuing challenges to be met. There are conti continuing projects that we want to be able to invest in. So we will continue to strive every day to continue to improve our financial position, to be prudent around the financial health of the club, and to put us on a strong footing to progress. As Andrew said, I'm happy to answer any questions on the presentation or the wider financial results at the Q&A session at the end. But now the section of today's proceedings that you've all been patiently waiting for, the opportunity to hear what really matters from the football club. And it's my absolute pleasure to introduce to the floor the 18th manager of Rangers Football Club, Ladies, gentlemen, fellow shareholders, please provide a very, very warm welcome to our new gaffer, Michael Beale. Michael, thank you for sitting down with us this morning. Firstly, can you tell us what it means to you to be the 18th manager of this football club? Morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's, it's fantastic to be back at the football club. Obviously, some familiar faces in the crowd today and delighted to be back and, and representing you. Uh, the last week has, has been a whirlwind, a lovely one, going back into the training ground and seeing a lot of familiar faces on the staff and, and obviously the players as well, along with the board. Um, the job comes with huge responsibility uh, towards yourself and obviously the club as the institution it is, but I'm supremely confident and uh, delighted to be back and representing everybody. And over the past year or so, can you tell us a bit about your transition into first team management, how that's been for you and how ready you feel for this challenge? It's been very smooth. Obviously, um, I had a very hands-on role here previously for three and a half years. It was a wonderful journey with a few bumps, to say, in the road, to say the least, but obviously a lot of really high highlights and, and fantastic memories and experiences. It gives me great confidence taking this journey on now. Being a manager the last six months or so, it's been no change from the role that really are fulfilled here previously or at Aston Villa in terms of being a coach every day on the pitch and, and trying to get an identity into a group of players. Always worked very closely with recruitment as well because I think that's all got to fall in line with the way you want to play and the type of person you want within your football club. So 
Uh, I feel like I, I've been a manager for a lot longer than this short period that I've had at QPR. And four new members of coaching staff have joined you too. They all have a variety of experience. How key will that be moving forward? Well, it is a management team. Uh, you're overseeing a, a large group of players, a lots of different personalities and, and from cultural different backgrounds as well. So it's important that your staff are able to get around and almost water the grass, if you like, and spend a lot of time with the players. We are certainly wanting to be hands-on to understand their background and, and where they want to go in their careers and, importantly, what we feel they can bring to make a stronger Rangers. And the staff are going to be hugely important to me, like they are for any manager. Um, and they come with great experience to, to help us push onwards. And you obviously do know a number of the players here. How big a positive was that for you, coming in, knowing the players, knowing the strength and, and the quality that's in this squad? Well, probably 85% of the squad was recruited in the previous spell I had at the club. So I sat with a lot of those players during that. I knew their backgrounds, why they joined Rangers. I've obviously seen uh, being alongside them and for the last 12 months from the outside, them achieve a lot of the things that they wanted to achieve and also have some disappointments, it's fair to say, along the way. So I've been able to come back in and fit like a glove in terms of relationships. There's obviously some exciting new players that I'm happy to work with. And it's about being uh, collectively very strong, around a strong identity in terms of the way we want to play. It has to speak to you as fans. I think I have an understanding of exactly what you want to see on the pitch. And it's, it's important that we implement that fast and that people see some subtle changes that excite the fans. I think it's got to be exciting to play in first every day in training. So the training is vitally important. And if it is, then I think you'll see uh, some improvements at Ibrox in terms of your experience as fans as well. And you've spoken in, in the last week or so about this squad being winners, obviously lifting the Scottish Cup last season and, and reaching the final of the Europa League. How do you get the best out of this group going forward? I think we have to fuel each individual. It's the individuals, it's the players that go and play. So I need to give them a clear identity. I need to give them real clarity on their roles within the squad and within the team. And I need to look at them and make sure I'm seeing the right things in their eyes and their energy as well. I think it's, it's the two things being combined. But you're right, in the last eight to ten months, we've, we've brought some big teams back here to Ibrox and sent them away, sent them packing. Teams like Dortmund and Leipzig. Um, we've won a cup in the last 18 months. We won a league as Invincibles as well. So it's important we don't listen to all the background noise in terms of where people think our squad's at. It's important that we get to work and it's important that we create a strong identity on the pitch and that identity will be the rock really that, that, that moves us forward. I'm hugely excited and passionate about getting started. We have a little warm up this weekend against a very good team, but it really starts next Thursday against Hibs and I can't wait. And what have these... Sorry. <laughs> And what have these early stages in training been like and how have the players responded to that? Hugely competitive. The training's been very, very good. Uh, we've done six sessions together, which is not a lot, but obviously I've worked with this group before. I'm learning about the new players. I'm speaking to some of the players that have been here for a while and, and where they're at and their journeys and where they're at in terms of being part of a strong Rangers in the future. Um, I've gave it lots of energy because the passion and desire for me to come back and work for this club was so big. And uh, I'm excited about the future. Um, I don't want to make any bold statements. Um, I just want the team to go and perform strongly in the coming weeks. And like you said, it's all gearing up to that Hibs game. How much are you looking forward to, to being in the dugout as manager for that first competitive fixture? I can't wait just to be back at Ibrox and just in front of you as a crowd and it'd be a hugely proud moment for me and my family and for the staff as well. But I really want to see a reaction from the team, really want to see a reaction. Um, I'll, um, just, just while we're speaking, I'd like to, to credit Gio. I think he's a man of real high class. I think the way that he conducted himself and, and what he achieved last season, the European run, the Scottish Cup, I think we should commend him for, and for Stephen before, for bringing me in.
and obviously for Stephen previously for bringing me into the club and, and giving me this opportunity in terms of learning about Rangers and going on this wonderful journey and, and now finally coming back as, as manager myself. I think this is the start of a new journey right now, of course, and obviously it's, I'm hugely optimistic about the future. I don't listen to the background noise. I work with the people inside our club. I know that our club's such a big, historic club and institution, and I'm hugely proud to be here. So the, full, the, the future, for me, in my eyes, is extremely positive. And finally, just looking ahead, as, as we prepare for a busy period of fixtures, what key qualities do you want to see from your squad on the pitch? Real cohesion and togetherness. To take the handbrake off and play attacking football and run forward and be exciting and to really go for it in every game. We're Rangers, we shouldn't change for anybody. We should have a real strong identity on the pitch and every time we play, we should try to impact and force that upon our opponents. We shouldn't take a backward step against anybody. Uh, certainly not here at Ibrox. On that note, Michael, thank you for your time this morning and I'll hand back to Stuart. Thank you. Thanks, Louise, and thank you, Michael, and uh, good luck for everything that's coming ahead. That's us reached the end of the presentations and the interviews, so we're now at the Q&A stage. It's the usual format for you, those of you who have been here previous years. The, the mics will be in the aisles, so if you could step forward to the mics, say what your name is, and ask your question, and we'll direct it to the appropriate person at the table. Good morning. Thank you very much. My name's Tom Martin from Air. A, a short look back at this time last year when we had welcomed a fantastically experienced Dutch management team. After the year, two transfer windows, could Mr. Wilson explain why we don't have a single Dutch player that was signed? Yeah, no problem at all. So, first and foremost, uh, good morning everybody, firstly. The, the way that we work our, our recruitment here, I think there's a lot spoken about it uh, externally, which is natural, is the, the Rangers manager, whether it's Michael, whether it's Giovanni, or whether it's Stephen, would have final say in every player that's signed here. Um, our, our previous manager, Gio, who I would also pay tribute to, as Michael did, um, for some big achievements in his time here at Rangers. Um, we'd also have had final say in every player that came in. Um, there was, obviously I won't name any names, there was one Dutch player that we agreed terms with in the summer who agreed to join another club, but that was the only Dutch player that the manager had brought forward. There's one that he wanted to, to bring in the summer. Okay, thank you. Laura? Yeah. Hi, Laura Fox. Um, I'm asking questions on behalf, or one question on behalf of Club 1872 contributors. This question is for Douglas Park. Could Douglas Park please take this opportunity to speak directly to shareholders and supporters and outline his detailed vision and ambitions for the club if he remains as chairman? Can he specifically outline the plan for the next five years to return the club to success on the pitch and greater competence and accountability of it? The plan for the next five years is to win as many trophies as we can, to build a team that can go and win as many games as we can, and reinvest in the club as much as we possibly can. Thank you. And could, I, could I just add that I, personally, and the rest of the board, have absolutely no problem with having Club 1872. The problem between the board and 1872 is quite the problem. And I would like to see it resolved as soon as we can. But until the reluctance to sign an NDA, the same as every other individual does, creates a problem. The club 1872 are welcome anytime. We need supporters. We need supporters' support. And it is not in my intention never been my intention to fall out with anyone. And I'm speaking on behalf of myself, 
but I believe the board would agree with that. Thank you. I think Club 1872 contributors will appreciate that. There obviously is more detail to the conversations we've had about the NDA. I don't want to take up too much time because there are other people waiting to ask questions, but we'd be happy to publish the details of our correspondence on an NDA. We'll follow up with you on that after the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I uh, Brian Donoghue, ask a question about the number of uh, the players who have been long-term injured and what the chances of of getting them back because it seems that we've got, I think it's around eight to ten players in the first squad who haven't played a game for some considerable time. I'm sorry, what's your name, please? It's Brian Donahoe. Oh, Brian, sorry, I didn't recognise you. I can see you with the lights. <laughs> Ross? Yeah, both myself, maybe Michael wants to say something as well. Um, yeah, the injury situation has been a concern to, to Gio, to myself, to our medical team as well. I think it was widely predicted um, ahead of this season and it's something that Premier League managers up and down the, the, the Premier League were discussing at every single press conference, particularly clubs that play European football with squads that's international players that go away in international breaks as well. It was predicted that ahead of this World Cup there would be more injuries than ever before. Um, there's no doubt that we've experienced that uh, here at Rangers <clears throat> with a mixture of injuries happening during the season and uh, long-term injuries as well. Some of them, of course, suffered from last season like Yanis Hadji. Um, I think uh, I'll let Michael speak in a second if he wants, but we are really pleased that in the, in the last week since Michael took over that we've saw players return to the group from injury. The group's getting stronger uh, probably on a daily basis just now with people coming back and that's pleasing to see. Um, but I think it's also important to say that when there are injuries, albeit they were predicted, we don't take that lightly and uh, we are constantly evaluating our people, our processes, our structures inside the club to make sure that in every single area we can have as strong as possible Rangers in internally. Yeah, Michael, I'll just, I'll just follow on from Ross's comments then. It's been pleasing in the last week or so to hear that players are coming back quickly, which is important. Um, it's important we don't rush them because we want them back and to play consistently between now and the end of the season because some of the players that, that are missing certainly make us a stronger Rangers team. So it's important we get them back quickly. The only thing that I would add is in the last 12 months, um, the, the team have gone from training a certain way to a different way and there's been a lot of changes in staff which never helps the players in terms of uh, having a consistency in terms of their training base. Uh, changes in them things can can at times cause some discomfort to players. So I think that it's important moving forward we're consistent in that and, and the staff working with the players is consistent because it helps. Thanks. Thank you. Just on my left, please. Good morning. My name is George Hogan and again I'm asking questions on behalf of the contributors of Club 1872. And thank you very much for your comments, Mr Park, that you made. They will be noted. Can I ask Mr. Park, when he's answering these questions, have any further loans been repaid to RIFC board members John Bennett and Julian Woolhart since the period covered by the recent annual report? And if so, can you confirm how much was repaid, how much interest was payable on these loans to each party, and the level of any loans that are still outstanding and to whom? Mr Chairman, shall I? Can I take that, given that I'm one of the named lenders, you're absolutely right. So can I take that, please? Of course, um, of course you can. The out, we, we addressed this last year. So the outstanding loan on the seven-year facility, now six years to run, is £8 million. Um, it's the same interest rate as last year. It's 6%. Can I put that in a wee bit of context, just for my own personal commitment to the club? Some of my loan, it's in the annual report, but some of my loan was converted to equity. Uh, half a million pounds. I've since then bought shares as well, so I've gone to 5.1% of the equity. Um, I've got about 8 million uh, of that long-term debt. And please ask the man at the right, the auditor is sometimes hard to please. I've also given the club in recent weeks a 10 million facility, overdraft facility at uh, 5%. So my commitment is now 23 uh, million. Mr. Bennett, I am not 
commit, I am not questioning you or any Bond member's commitment. I asked a question on behalf of our contributors, and you haven't answered that question. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I haven't answered it. No. You've answered your own personal question. I asked a question about... Oh, sure. No, I was trying to put it into context, because there's obviously been a bit of uh, chatter about loans being repaid. Yes. Um, yes, they've been partly repaid over the terms of the seven-year facility, on the agreed terms. My outstanding commitment on the seven year, six years to run, is now eight million. Um, it's down to eight million. This time last year, I think we were at 13 and a bit total. So that is now eight. But um, Kenny referenced the, the, the fallow period, if you like, that the club will run into. Like any business, we have seasonality in our cash flow. Our fallow period starts in February. The club will have to start to draw down on my 10 million facility at 5%. That's a new working capital facility that I've provided to the club. I, all I, it wasn't so much my own question, but I think it was relevant con context to place 5.1% equity. So that's 5 million or so. 8 million left on the loan, which will be repaid uh, um, alongside the agreed schedule. Um, but 10 million of new. All I was saying was the repayment of loans has to be seen in the context of this, I think, increased commitment to the equity by myself, um, but also the new facility. I, I think that's valid context. I think there are other people here waiting, and thank you for your reply. Thank you. No? What is it? No, you go, sir. Uh, good morning, Stuart. Uh, Alan Harris. Uh, oh, hi, Alan. I'm going to surprise you by not asking a question about my jazz. I'll leave that to, <laughs> to somebody else. I want to pick up on the point about player trading uh, because I believe it's very, it's probably more important than my jazz. Um, if the research I've done is correct, this season so far we've made a, a profit on player trading of somewhere on the order of 15 million pounds. But have we had a positive balance in terms of? the players that have come in. When you look at the stats, we've played 27 games, but on average, these players that have come in have only played half those games. If you take out Trolak and Tillman and look at the actual minutes on the park, these players have only played in six games on average out of 27, which is just over 20%. I'd like to highlight one particular example, which is last season, we sold Nathan Patterson because we had an established right back and we had an up and coming right back in Divine in the B team. This summer we had an established left back. He might not be the best left back in the world, but he's at the World Cup. He said scored seven goals for Rangers and 41 assists in 180 matches. So he's a decent player and we have two left backs in the B team, one of whom is the captain. So my question is, have we had value for money in terms of the players who have come in and is our policy consistent? Thank you. Thank you, Alan, thank you for your question. I think when you sit second in the league when you're Rangers, you're always gonna be disappointed with the, with the return from the whole squad rather than focusing on the seven players that came in in the summer. So I think, if, whether it's me as a sporting director, Michael in the seat that he sits in, we're always going to be disappointed in the return that we've got. There's no question about that. However, we have a lot of belief in this squad. Um, Michael touched on that early, earlier on. He also used a word which is really, really important to us, which is about identity and making sure that we've got a team on the pitch that represents our shareholders and supporters proudly every single week. So at this moment in time, of course, we're not happy with the return. That goes without saying. I noticed that you pulled um, some of the players that have done well out of the statistics that you said there. It would definitely be true that some of those players have made a fantastic return for us and others haven't made a, a strong enough return yet. That, that goes without saying. And it's up to all of us inside the club, led by Michael on the pitch every day, to get the best out of this squad we possibly can. And we certainly believe there's more to come from them. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. On the left. <coughs> My name is Robert Gibson. I've been a season ticket holder since 1983 84. 
I'm asking about this, my Rangers, for allocation of tickets. On your um, next season, or past seasons, on your application form for your season ticket, you ask for family names and seats so that you would sit together in semi-finals or final tickets. My son and I so happen to be in the My Rangers, but my granddaughter is not, and we, we don't get three years tickets. My granddaughter does not get a ticket for the next semi-final. I'm just wondering why, how the allocation comes to get tickets. My son had told me for I did get a ticket at the 2008 final. This final last year, I didn't get a ticket, my son says, because I was only a silver Rangers supporter. I've been following Rangers since the 1950s. I was here with Willie Waddle played, Johnny Hubbard, George Young. I've been here in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. In the 80s, with Mr Murray as season ticket holders to give it your season ticket double, and you get it back at 10% over the next 10 years. We did that. I've been through, through the 80s with Walt, with Graham Soonis, Walter Smith, right through the 90s, 2000. The Rangers went into third division. I still have my season ticket. I've been there ever since, and I don't understand why. Now, I'm a Ranger, I'm only a, a silver Rangers. And how do I get to be a, a gold Rangers supporter? <laughs> Thank you. It's Just to say, I'm my 81st year. You know, Sorry? I'm in my 81st year, so I, I don't think I can give you 10 years. <laughs> so it's, it's a perennial problem, the Rangers. It's just the, the supply and demand of tickets is the, it's the starting point for how we, we, we try and satisfy as many of you as we can when it comes to different games, especially the big games. We understand there's always disappointment amongst a large proportion of the fan base when it comes to the games. And we've tried different ways over the years to, to try and reward loyalty. I mean, you're obviously hugely loyal in terms of the years you've followed the club and, and supported the club. And obviously the way we're doing it at the moment doesn't seem to work for you. But we're never going to find a way that satisfies everybody, unfortunately. You know, we have tried changing it. We've changed it and it's worked for some people and not for others. So while supply and demand is, is out of kilter, the way it is, unfortunately, we're always going to have a, have a challenge there, I'm afraid. I kind of understand what you're saying, but when you have your season ticket and you ask for your families to sit together and you give them... My granddaughter sits beside me. She's now 18. My son's 51. We've been there since he was 14 or before where you could sit anywhere. What I'm saying is if you, if you put your name down in your season ticket for the three years to sit together, why we don't go... In the, is, well, Who, whoever organises, whoever's in charge and organises, must look on a list and say, there's, there's the three Gibsons there, we'll, put, we'll give them sit together. Well, listen, if you've, there if are you've, just two of us. Sorry to interrupt, but if you've, if you've ticked those boxes on the forum, you should be together. So can you come and see me at the end? And I'll get your details and we'll catch up with you at the end and I'll try and find out what's happened. I'll come and catch you, son, don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect you will, but I'm not able to run you, I don't think. Next to my right, please. Thank you. Good morning, I'm David Ferguson from Renfrew. Before I make my point, I asked a question last year about the customer services being poor, and, and before I go any further, it, it really isn't much better. But my point this year is maybe for James Bisgrove. I'm interested to hear that you're talking about record merchandising sales. Because as far as I can see, we don't have much in the way of merchandising. We've got stores that sell castor gear. So I don't know, do we run them, or do castor run them? The choice of other stuff out with that is shocking. I go back 10, 20 years, you could go in that shop and you could buy jewellery, hip flasks, wine and spirits, you could buy posters, you could buy lampshades for the kids, carpets, wallpaper, curtains. I see, I see people online, and don't forget the rubber duck bits just came back out here. <laughs> but um, I see people online just now and they're saying, where can I get stocking fillers for my kids? and they're getting directed to eBay, they're getting directed to Etsy, because the store has very little in it. Online has virtually nothing in it out with these shops, out with the shirts, sorry. And they have nothing for the future generation. I remember going to Ibrox when I was wee, and you get your pocket money to spend. You go into that ranger shop, there is nothing under a tenner 
for kids to spend their money on. You used to be able to get crisps, sweets, chocolate, nothing there at all. So the kids have no items to buy. The adults virtually have no items to buy out with cast the Do they make the choice of what goes in there or do we make the choice? Because I know you guys like us to spend money and you're missing a big trick, <laughs> with especially at Christmas time. And just to finish off, who sanctioned a commemorative poster from our worst ever home defeat in history? Who, who was that guy? Thank you um, for the question and good morning to all the shareholders from, from, from my perspective. Um, but I, th I think the journey we've been on and the journey we're on with, with Castor is continuing. Um, when we first entered into that partnership, clearly there was a focus on playing kits, training wear. That was the nature of the deal. In the last year, 18 months, there's been a really strong emphasis on licensed products, on some of the accessories that you've referred to there. We're now up to five Ranger stores in the UK. And I think this Christmas and this trading period, there is the broadest range of official Rangers products that we have had in many, many years. Uh, but I agree with you that we, that we shouldn't shop, uh, we shouldn't stop, rather, because there is a, a strong appetite and there are new products emerging all the time. So the relationship is as such with Castor that we are very collaborative on product development. And I can assure you that as we move forward to the partnership, Next year and, 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 and beyond there will be a broader product range, both in store, and I'm particularly excited about the new store that will open in New Edmiston House in January, two floors of retail space. Uh, I talk often with Castor around our ambitions of having a full 360 degree retail experience in that store, so I invite you to come and see that in, in January, and I hope that you can recognize some of the progress that we've made, and additionally online to make sure that supporters, whether they be in North America, India, the Middle East, can access Rangers products through the, through the online network. Okay, thank I do believe though there was a, a kind of gathering of uh, people a, a month or two ago that uh, it was one of the ones that was on the MyJers letter, put your name forward, we're going to talk about merchandise. Did anything actually come out of that? Was, it, was there similar questions asked there? I'm sorry, I didn't quite pick up the, the, the questions about it was, our competition. No, it was, it was one of the, the gatherings, you know, an opinion. A focus group. A focus uh, okay. group, yeah, and, right. and it was about merchandising, which I put, yes. my, name, I put, my, name for, I put my name for from all, still yet to hear about yeah. any of them. No, I've, I've got you now. Yes, we, we had a session with, I think, 15, 20 MyJers members with the retail team that work in our department, and we took on board a number of different points and feedback, and a lot of that was specific to product development, and that's actually formed part of our meetings with Castor. I'm actually in Manchester tomorrow meeting Castor myself, so as I say, it's a very collaborative relationship, and the supporter input from that fan forum went directly through to Castor, and has actually informed some of our kit designs as well for, for next season. Okay, thank you. Um, it's just as well, probably, whoever sanctioned the 7-1 posters are staying anonymous anyway. Thanks, David. On my left, please. Thank you. Good morning. My name's Mark Campbell. Um, my question follows on a little bit from Alan's. Um, despite an incredible European run, great strides in commercial revenue, and the fans' continued amazing support, it did still take a record player sale to take us into an operating profit for the year. This highlights the importance of a sustained player trading model, good contract management, and getting value from the level of wages that we pay. At the, at the 2019 AGM, two figures were provided, estimates, present value of the squad, 55 million above book value, potential to be 103 million above book value. Can you please provide an update on those numbers to give comfort we're still on the right track? Kenny, do you want to take that? Do you want me to take it? Yeah, so that, that number was a, a notional number given by Chairman Mr King at that time. Uh, there wasn't any science behind that number at all. Um, so I, I wouldn't be prepared to answer that question because I'd be picking a figure out there and I don't think that's the right thing to do to shareholders. Okay, thank you. Okay, next to my right. Uh, morning, board. Uh, my name is Trevor. Uh, I'll start with a negative and try and end in a positive. Um, I'm wondering what the thought process was behind the Champions League match package that was announced a few months ago, uh, considering what's happened since. Um, obviously, the board will be aware of current circumstances, cost of living crisis. I could go on and on and on. 
Um, I'm just wondering why the board went in at, I believe, tell me if I'm wrong, the, the highest level that UEFA allow, considering everything that we're going through at the moment, considering the loyalty during the COVID season, all those kind of things. Um, I think we were just looking for a wee bit of something back. I don't know, it's not a charity. You could say that you don't need to buy the tickets. Um, the only way I was able to buy the tickets and then is I had a bit of seats of money there, which I used for it. Um, otherwise, I couldn't have went. It's just, I think the board got aware of their environment with the situation like that, and I want to end in a, in a positive. Um, uh, I believe, uh, well, I understand there was a statue for the late and great Walter Smith Commission, which I am really, really chuffed with, so thank you very much, guys. Um, <laughs> Uh, but there's one other legend that I think needs still to be honoured as well, and that's also the late and great Jimmy Bell, who's just as much of a legend. Um, I know he wasn't a, a manager, he was part of the playing squad. I'd like to see him hopefully honoured in a way, name, stand, statue, or how about something different, guys? How about, um, how about uh, instead of that situation, uh, you put them in the Hall of Fame? Why can't staff members that show that kind of loyalty have a place forever in Rangers Football Club? Thank you. Thank you. No, thank Jimmy. Jimmy uh, was a huge character around the club, and he is hugely missed around the club. I think every single one of us knew Jimmy well, and uh, yeah, listen to you. Take your point, and I think it's it's a it's a fair point, very well made, and um, we'll, we'll have a chat about that because I think Jimmy Jimmy epitomised so much about the club. You know, he really was Rangers through and through. Taking your point about the prices, uh, I get the point you're making as well. We had a lot of debate over what we what we would end up, what the pricing structure of those tickets would be, and we landed on the you know the, the numbers that we landed on. We, we sold out. I'm not saying that makes it right or wrong, but we, you know, the, the demand was there for the games. You'll have seen from the numbers that Kenny's presented today that we are, you know, we are we're fighting for everything to try and keep in a level playing field with our competitors, uh, you know, both domestically and in Europe. So we, we try and maximise it. But I get that we're at the high end of, of the scale, and, and I take the point that you're making. Okay. Cheers. Thank you. Hey, uh, this is mainly a question for Ross Wilson. You replied to Alan Harris there that he missed out the success stories of signings in your time. When you look at the players signing during your tenure, we've had very few successes and a lot of failures. You could maybe pass Hadji, Roof, Defoe and Bassey at successes. But when you look at the failures under your watch, going by reports, it's quite expensive. We spent £2 million on Janino Bakuna. Aaron Ramsey was reported to be from anywhere from 780000 to £3 million. Zakowski was signed for 500 k played one game. Diallo came up for Man United, failure. We've now signed Rabi Matondo for three million pounds. He's not hit the ground. And then you also spoke about injuries and how it was unpredictable. Did you action the signing of our centre back from Hearts when he's missed 44 games at Hearts over the last two seasons? <laughs> it's also worth noting that Hearts usually play Saturday to Saturday. Over the last few years, we've been Sunday, Thursday, Sunday. That player was never going to be able to cope with the demand. And also, this question is mainly for Stuart Robertson or the rest of the board. Does the board firmly believe that Ross Wilson is the right man to develop this playing squad? Thanks for the question. First, it, uh, the, the short answer is yes. And there's a lot of work goes on. I don't think, uh, maybe we haven't got the message across, but there's masses of work goes on in the football department at this football club. The progress we have made since Ross Wilson has joined has been incredible, actually, on the football side of the club. So, you know, that, so I, think, I think your criticism's there. Everybody's got an opinion, and that's fair enough. Can I just Ross, Ross can chat to you about the, the specific players. It's just but in terms of where we are as a football club compared to where we were three years ago in the football department, we are miles forward. Wait, can I just reply to that quickly? Can I just come back to your question first, please? Yeah, no worries. Thanks for it, firstly. Without without being too direct, none of your figures are correct. I don't like talking about individual players because there's myself, the manager, the scouting team, all of the coaches, everybody's involved in that process. So the first thing I'll say is Ross Wilson doesn't sign football players. 
clearly it's a department that I oversee, but I work very closely. Michael might want to make a, uh, a remark here if he, if he sees fit. <clears throat> I don't like talking about individuals, but I will talk about two individuals that you've named there, because to stand at the mic and say that Rangers bought Janino Bacuna for two million is complete nonsense. Janino Bacuna was a free transfer who was brought forward by the coaching staff at the time as a player that we all, we all bought into together. He was free. We actually made a profit in Janino Bacuna. That doesn't mean he was a good signing. Secondly, we all went into the John Souter signing with our eyes wide open. We know that he's a big talent. We also know that the injury track record is difficult for us. And we, we believe that we can deal with that. We might be wrong with that. And we always have to have the humility to say that we'll get things wrong. But we believe that we can sort that out. We believe that John can be a, can be a strong player for Rangers. Every player that we sign doesn't have to play 60 games in the way that Connor Goldson has for us over a number of years now. We will have players that also have to be part of our squad and we also need to make sure we've got Scottish players in our squad to meet the European rules as well. So all of that needs consideration that Michael from the manager and coach's side might want to, might want to add to that, but I know you want to come back in after that. It was just to further on, Stuart Robertson said that we've had huge success on the park. When we were humiliated off of Celtic in September, we started the game with five players who were signed during Mark Allen or Frank McPallan's time. When we finished the game, it was six. That's not really, that's not really forward thinking or success. You have to look over the longer term from where the club was to where we are. We got to a Europa League final this season. And yet we we're still starting Cup. games with So we'll have ups and downs, we'll have short-term situations where we will fall out. We've had injuries as well, in terms of a lot of, numbers of, a lot of members of the squad have been injured. So, yeah, listen, everybody views it differently. Everybody will have an opinion on it. I get that. That's one of the beauties of a football club and on the supporter base that we have. Everybody has their own opinions on it. But when you see the amount of work and the foundations that we have and, and the, the systems and structures and processes we have in place behind the scenes now, it is, it's miles away from where we were years ago, and it gives me the confidence that we're, we're moving forward in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, we were due to finish this at quarter to 12. We're going to keep it going for another seven or eight minutes to five past. So we'll try and rattle through as many of these questions if, as we can. If you can keep them short, please. Hi there, folks. Uh, my name is David Phillip from David Phillip Property Investments. Uh, I've got access to some high net worth individuals that are looking for investment and loan opportunities. Um, myself and Kenny Bartley worked previously, so I commend you on the sort of financial um, side of things. Is there an opportunity for external investment, um, nationally or internationally? Um, mm -hmm. and is it something we would be happy to discuss in private at all? Can I give a short answer to that? Subject to some resolutions passing today, yes. Thank you. Good morning. My name's Billy. Uh, first of all, you've had some tough questions today. Uh, my question's a little bit different. Firstly, I want to congratulate you on delivering positive results for Rangers. As a board, Rangers got to the European Cup final. We won the Scottish Cup and uh, we got into the Champions League. However, my question to all the board, apart from Michael, is can you really say, hand on heart, that you showed honour to your fellow human being in 2021 when people like me got a blue letter like this and did not comply with tyrannical instructions from the Scottish Nasty Party? They implemented digital ID via coercion and you complied. People like me who have supported Rangers from a young age were not allowed to come into the stadium. We were outside like dogs. That was segre segregation. It was discrimination. Okay. It's been Can we move on to the next question, please? Mary, please. Henry. I want you to know why. All the Rangers fans want ready my gas because when there's no work working for the fans, have you started my gas so you get ready at? Because the fans want ready at. And the fans are not getting the tickets where they should be getting tickets. Okay. It's well, it's a di disability people, armless disabled, 
we are not getting any tickets for the away games. And every time the fans went, they, they were telling me to pull up, to get ready in my gears, because it's no worth a damn. Right. Uh, Henry, let, let me deal with the same. We, we, I know you, you and I have this debate every year, but been, we're actually, hang on, no, I've actually got a wee bit we are breaking no, news. No, no, we're actually we're making some progress on the disabled tickets with some of the clubs, not all of them. I'm talking about disabled people. I'm but, talking about the rest of the fans. The okay, Henry, what, what, let me let me ask because other people have got questions to ask. So on that disabled side of things, we actually are making some progress with some of the clubs. But again, I'll catch up with you at the end. I'll fill you in on that because I know that uh, the last time I spoke to you, I hadn't. James is going to give you a quick uh, quick answer to your my dear's question. Yeah, I mean, I think, and thank you for the question. I think it refers back to Stuart's earlier point. Uh, if, if, I, if I've understood. Because your fans you're not coming back if we don't get ready, my dear. No, I, I, I take your point. I, re I respect your point. And the, the challenge we have with the way tickets, again, is the demand and, and the supply, and that limited supply we have when we're getting 15, 20,000 applications from supporters, and there might be one or 2,000 tickets available. So, what we've tried to implement is a loyalty framework whereby supporters have had season tickets for the longest period, received the most tickets, and you know we, we, we are constantly trying to adapt that, take different opinions on board. But for us. MyJers is a really important supporter initiative. We've got 52,000 members now. The funds go directly into the first team, and we use it for a lot of different things, experiences at the stadium for younger fans, whether that be Christmas parties or Halloween events or open training sessions. So I acknowledge that it potentially isn't perfect because we hear a lot of different opinions, and we welcome those opinions because we want to continue to shape it, but it also stands for a lot of good initiatives. And, I, and as I said, the away tickets challenge is one that I think we will never get right because we're always going to disappoint the majority, unfortunately. Why don't you let me stop you shooting at Ibrox? It's not so... Henry, listen, I'll catch you at the end, but we need to get to through some more questions if we can, please. Thank you, Henry. The uh, gentleman on the left. Um, <coughs> sorry, Stuart. I'm... Sorry. OK, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Um, Stuart, it's Steve Singler here. You'll be very pleased to know I've not got a criticism this year and no challenges for you. From what I see with the new disabled facilities, they're looking spot on. Can I ask when it's intended to start? There's still a lot of work to be done on the investigation of it, but the, the, the hope is that we will start it in the summer of 2023. That's, that's the current timescales that we're looking at. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Morning. Uh, my name is George Joyce. This is for uh, Ross. Ross, you recently said you were comfortable with the contract situations uh, of Fredo and Ryan. Um, the importance of uh, player trading, why are, is that three key players been allowed to run their contracts down in the final year? Yeah, yeah th thank you for that question. I think that one's actually really important. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they're not being allowed to run their contracts down. We would absolutely, and I think Michael said it in the press comments last week, we would absolutely like <clears throat> those two players that you've mentioned to commit their futures to Rangers. You saw during Kenny's presentation that there's a clear willingness from the board to invest in the squad. <clears throat> However, for a player to sign a contract, I'm going to state the obvious here, there needs to be certainly two parties willing to commit, the football club and the player. You also need the agent. You sometimes need the wife. You sometimes need the mum, the dad, everybody involved. The two, the two players um, in particular, Ryan and Alfredo, are two very different situations, um, which again, I don't think it's fair to go into why they're different situations, but they are different situations. But there is definitely a willingness from the club for the boys to stay with us. There's definitely a willingness from the manager for the two boys to be part of uh, Rangers moving forward. Um, and then time will tell if we can get there. But certainly from the club's point of view, we would want the players to be with us. I get that, but um, why would they not try to move them on in the summer? Well, again, you would, need, you would need two things to happen there. You would need a buyer, and you would need a, a buyer to commit a level of finance that we think would be reflective of something that, that would be good for Rangers at that moment in time. With, with both players in the past, we've, we rejected one offer for both players, um, which was significant on the basis that the money that we were offered was good. However, we thought the players were of more value to our squad in that, at that time. And we went on to become league champions in that same season. So 
in our minds that justified that decision to be the right one. Um, but we would certainly like those two players to continue with us if we can, um, if we can reach an agreement with them in the coming weeks and months. Right, can I just add the board, the board have tried to negotiate with both players, and there comes a stage where in any negotiation you try to settle, and if the terms that maybe people are looking for are unattainable, you've sometimes got to accept you've done your best. Can we have one final question, please? I'm afraid, that given the time, it's we're due to finish at quarter two. Yes. Hi, good morning. My name is Norm MacDonald. My ranger's number is 1911. It's a quick question about disablement to do with the Albion car park. What is the policy there? Every time I go, there's a different policy. Some nights you get in, some nights you don't. Some nights you get in with a disabled badge, some nights you have to pay a tenner. What is the policy? Why can't I buy a season ticket like I used to eh, before COVID? You could have to buy a, a year's ticket to get in. Eh? So, if there's anybody I can speak to about that, I'd be grateful. If you have an answer now, thank you. I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch that. Could you, could you repeat it, please? Sorry, uh, it's, to do with, it's to do with the Albion car park, eh? And the policy there. Every sorry. time I go, it's different. You have to go really early to get in. I'm disabled. I like to use the car parks near the stadium. So what is the policy, and where can I find out what it is on each individual night? We are aware that there has been issues in the Albion car park and, and in other areas around the stadium with, with disabled parking. Um, it's an area we're trying to resolve um, and we are also looking at bringing in a new uh, way of dealing with QR codes and, and scanning to get make sure that there's availability for uh, disabled parking within those areas. Um, so I'd like to think that that will be up and running within the next couple of months. <laughs> okay, thanks for that. Cheers, cheers. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I just say to, to all of you, thank you so much for attending. I think this has been the, the largest gathering certainly since I've been at the club, and it's great to see so many of you here. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'm sorry we haven't got through all of the questions, but unfortunately we've, we've run out of time, so apologies for that. If you could please uh, hand your cards in on the way out and we'll register the votes. You'll see it as you go through. There's boxes at the back of the room there. People will collect your votes. And just to say thank you very much. The guys I said I would see at the end, I'll, I'll catch you at the end of the stage as well. Okay, thank you very much, everyone.